Today, we'll be talking about navigating the tax changes for our businesses. And this is great for anyone who has started running a business, you run a micro business, small business, medium sized businesses. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, the government had uh, or has already passed a bill around taxation um, that is affecting very many businesses, especially to the because of what is going on at the moment due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the government um, is trying to see how do we make sure that uh, people are able to to feel a bit of reprieve, even as the pandemic continues to affect our economy, even as it continues to affect us in different ways. Some businesses have been positively affected, others have been negatively affected, but when the government set up these directives, uh, our trainer is going to share with us why it did that and which are these some of these tax changes that we as people who own these businesses or businesses need to be able to look out for and i'd like to share with you um who our trainer is our trainer for today is cpa josfat irura he is one of our trainers at centronomy and he's he trains uh, in Centronomy Entrepreneur, he runs two accounting sessions in the Centronomy Entrepreneurship Program. And this is to help people or business owners not necessarily be accountants, but to know what they should be looking out for when it comes to accounting in your business, when it comes to bookkeeping in your business. He also runs the program Pricing for Consultants, and we will be having that program online very soon. And this is a program for all people who, or all business owners who are consultants or who run consulting firms. Could be in the medical space, could be in the creative space, could be in the coaching space, could be in any space, but you're a consultant. How do you price and how do you navigate through pricing? But today, the Centronomy Entrepreneur brings to you this session on navigating through tax changes by our awesome trainer, CPA Josphat Karibusana. Hey, morning, Sheba. Morning to you. Thanks for the warm introduction. For a minute, I was about to ask who is, the, who is being described, but you ended by saying it's just for Tirura, so I take confidence in that. Thanks once again for everybody who has joined us, who has taken the opportunity to join us in today's session. Just as Sheba has put clearly where I put it, is that it's a session around navigating through the tax changes. Lately, we've as a result of the pandemic that we are going through as a country and on a, on a global scale, Kenya not being any exception, there are a number of changes that have come and have affected our businesses, whether large or small. And as a directive by the government, what we introduced around April, that's when the president made some directives which were meant to cushion the businesses. The whole point was to give them some form of liquidity and how they can navigate through the tough moments. So that's what we shall be going through today. It's uh, just uh, just to put it clearly, it's just as the title suggests, it's navigating through the changes that have come in. And I know that we are going through tough times, we are going to make tough decisions. And at the same time, some tax changes have already been effected. So it's only fair that we understand what is it that is going on behind the scenes and how does it affect us in our businesses. So without further ado, my name is Joshua Tirura, a CPA by profession. And just as Sheba said, we run together the accounting module on the, for the entrepreneur class. And also what we try to do is just to sensitize people to understand their business transactions and also to understand what implications their businesses are, are likely to face from both an accounting and also a taxation perspective. But strictly today, it will be around the taxation, and we just want to see what these are. And more so now that we are nearing the month of June, which is dreaded by every business owner when it comes to filing of tax returns. So we just want to make sure that people have an understanding, or rather they have a better picture of where do things lie. So just a few housekeeping rules. It's more, it's going to be a one hour webinar and we are going to cover, we've, we are going to cover a number of items. And also we are going to create room for the questions that you could be having. And what we shall be having, I'm sharing with you the agenda of the day. 
Sherba, please confirm that you can see the agenda. The yes, I can see. Slide. Okay. Yeah. So the agenda for the day, we are going to, we have got four sessions, which we intend to cover in that one hour and also leave time for questions that you could be having. And the first part we are going to look at is get, just to get an overview of the tax laws or rather the, the tax laws amendment act 2020. So from there, we shall be looking at which fiscal measures have been affected, have been affected by the act. Then we are going to look at value added tax, that's VAT. So we are going to understand the different categories that are there and also what amendments have come through. And we are also going to look at the bulky one. This is where majority of the changes lie. And it's around the Income Tax Act, what amendments are there. Then from there, we are going to have a brief uh, walkthrough on what is the way forward. Then after that, we shall leave a session for Q&A answers, or rather for questions and answers that you could be having. And in, we do, I will be picking questions as we move on. And in case of any further clarifications, we'll be available to share more insights on the same. So on to the first part of the session where we are looking at an overview of the Tax Laws Amendment Act. What I can say is that the Tax, the tax Amendment Act came through in, it was assented on 25th April, which was 2020. And I remember it was on a Saturday, so it showed you how, how dire the situation was because it had to be done urgently. And it was in reaction to the, I remember, you remember there are some directives which the president had made on 25th March, 2020. And these are the ones that were meant to cushion Kenyan businesses and also employees <clears throat> around the, the pandemic. So for that to happen, for those directives to become effective, it had to come through an act of parliament and that's what was effected. And that's how we found ourselves where we are. So the things that were affected in terms of the measures that, were, that came into place, the first one, which we shall also now be going through in our session is there was a 100% tax relief for persons earning gross income of up to 24,000. What this basically means is that any person who was uh, whose salary is up to 24,000, they are not going to pay any tax. Uh, and the tax there we are going to talk about is pay as you earn tax. But however, these other deductions still apply. The PAYR, uh, the NHIF, the NSSF, all those others still apply. But in terms of tax, that person is exempted from any tax or any tax angle to it. Then the other item that came through as from those fiscal measures is that there was a reduction of personal income tax top rate. We remember for a very long time, we've been saying Kenya is one of the highly taxed countries in the region, but now this one has put at a slightly advantageous position because the top tax rate that uh, uh, employees will be paying is has been reduced from the 30% bracket down to 25%, which is a huge relief and it gives us some form of caution. What that means is, is that, so we were talking about the second section around the reduction of personal income tax. The first one is that we were, taking, we were saying the top tax rate has changed from 30% down to 25%. And what that means is that what you are paying as a business owner as tax as, has reduced, meaning that the employee is now taking home more than they were taking earlier. But in terms of the wage figure, it still remains the same. The beauty of it is also these fees commissions, they've also benefited the businesses. So the corporate corporation income tax rate has also shifted from 30% to 25%. The only disclaimer that I would like to mention at this point is that remember this became effective on 25th April, 2020. So this one is not for the tax returns that we shall be filing for 30, 31st December 2019, but rather it shall be for 2020 going forward. So meaning is from this year onwards. The other item that changed is that there was this tax, which we call turnover tax. Remember the tax bracket keeps on being broadened as much as possible. So turnover tax is a tax which is paid by biz small businesses, mostly as MSMEs and SMEs and the rate changed from 3% down to 1%, which was a positive change. And we shall also be looking into that as to how it, how it affects our businesses. The other item that came through was the VAT rate changed from 16% down to 14%. 
So it means that the cost of goods will also be going down because of the VAT element. And the other item that came into place was the amendment of provision. For determination of tax above value for petroleum products place on 15th of May 2020. That was a change that came that came a bit later. What that means is that that how the tax rate will be how the taxable amount will be computed for for items like gas, LPG, there are some now they have to be included. So we expect that some changes, maybe even as much as we're going to be hearing of the world oil prices are going down, we don't expect that all products will go down because of some of these tax changes, which is uniform, or which is going to be affecting our particular products, and mostly the LPG, because those ones are computed at 14%, whereas the diesel and the petroleum, those ones are computed at 8%. So, if we can go to the first session, which is around the value added tax, that's the VAT. I'll start by demystifying some of these terminologies that we always hear. We've got three VAT categories whenever we hear, whenever we talk about VAT in business. Remember the first thing to mention about VAT is that VAT is a value added tax, which is chargeable by any business who has, which has already attained a a turnover of 5 million per annum, or also you could not have attained 5 million, but the nature of your business requires that you register for VAT involuntarily. And this one mostly affects people who deal with government. If it doesn't matter whether you're a startup or you're an established business, the minute you start dealing with government and government entities, VAT checks in. So what shall be happening is we have got three VAT categories. And the first one is what we call a standard rate supply. Standard rate supply means the VAT is going to be charged, but charged at 14%. And what that means is what I charge my clients and what I'm, I'm allowed to claim back from what my, my suppliers charge me. So that's what it means by a standard rate supply. On the other hand, we have what we call an exempt supply. An exempt supply simply means no VAT is charged for that particular product. And as a VAT registered client or a VAT registered business, you are not supposed to claim any VAT that you've been charged because you're dealing with products that also deal with that have no VAT of their own. However, sometimes we find ourselves with a mixture of both standard and exempt, but as for that case, there is an allocation formula that is given by KRA on how you can distinguish the two. Then the third item that we call uh, the that VAT category is what we call the zero rated supply. So this one is, sorry, it means the VAT is being charged, but it's being charged at, it should have been at 0%. So you're charging VAT, but at a rate of zero, which is different from what is an exempt supply, which because exempt supply you're charging, but you're not charging a VAT at all. And what happens for the VAT uh, zero rated supplies, it means that you can claim back that v input VAT. And that comes in handy when you doing when you talk about our tax returns every 20th day of the month. That's when you do for the pre previous month. That's what we shall be. That's what we look at. So it's important to understand those three categories so that even as we go through this session, we shall be able to understand what it means. Now, the changes that came through the fiscal, the changes that came through the VAT Act amendment is that what had indicated there for taxable value of petroleum products. So when we are looking at the, what, because VAT is charged on a, on a certain amount, there are some costs which had been excluded earlier on, and those ones were excess duty, fees, and other charges. So those ones were being omitted earlier when you are computing what was the VAT value. But now we've seen a scenario where the excess duty and fees, as well as other charges, have been included. So what that means is that the tax base has been increased, and therefore when you load the 14%, and you are loading it on a higher amount. And that is what I was saying is likely to contribute to a high, or rather to a hike in some of the petroleum products that we buy, especially the LPG gas and all that. Then there was also another change around issuance of credit notes. Remember, a credit note is given whenever you've, maybe you've raised an invoice, but maybe some goods were had to be returned or the work had to be redone. So when, when we issue credit notes, the time frame has come that you need to do it within six months from the date of the tax invoice. 
So what that means is that it affects some businesses which have also been, uh, maybe you could be having an ongoing dispute. And what happens is that the dispute, in as, the minute once the dispute has been settled, you are still allowed to raise the six, you are still allowed to raise a credit note, even though the dispute could have gone for a longer duration than, than the six months. So let's take note whenever you're raising a credit note, let it be timely, do it within six months after raising the tax invoice. Then the other change that came through was the refund of tax on bad debts. So what happens is sometimes you may supply goods to a customer, then these goods, this customer goes bad and the goods have not been, the, the customer has not paid you. So let me use a case in point, assuming you had supplied goods to Nakumat, then Nakumat is unable to pay you. What happens is that you are entitled as a business owner. Remember when you filed your VAT on that particular month, you disclosed it as a sale, you paid for that VAT, yet the customer had not paid you. So you are now being told in case you have a bad debt, such as an amount which is not payable, the period of claiming for that VAT has been reduced. Initially, you had been given up to five years to claim that VAT, but now it has been reduced to four years. However, another thing that you need to we need to be cognizant is that a bad debt for VAT purposes is considered, or rather a debt is considered to be a bad debt for VAT purposes after it has gone outstanding for a duration of up to three years. So what this puts us is in a very tough position because you have to, first of all, maybe three years have elapsed. That's when you can say that that amount is a bad debt. But you only have one more year to claim back that VAT. So in case you have VAT on bad debts, it's, you need to be very timely. Otherwise, we could lose out on some of these VAT amounts. Then record maintenance, this, this was an interesting one. It was ruled that five years records have to be maintained, whether you are registered for VAT or not. So in case you are running in business and you need to maintain your business records, make sure that you can have them for at least five years. It doesn't matter. Initially, the, rec the law was strictly for VAT registered businesses, but now it has been changed to include even the non-VAT registered businesses. Then the other item is that if there were some changes, some which were positive, some which were negative when it comes to reclassification of supplies for VAT purposes. So initially, the government had tried to put in some measures which will encourage manufacturing. So they had put manufacturing, the plant and machinery to be exempt from VAT, but now we've seen it change from exempt to 14% status. So in case you're going to be importing a machine, be prepared that when you're going to pay some VAT for it. In case you are in the renewable energy and you're dealing with biogas digesters or biogas because they had been given as an incentive, that one has also been changed from exempt category to 14% status. The only people who could have, in a way, gained is when we talk about the PPE equipment, especially these ones that you're going through for the COVID-19, the PPE, the face masks and all. So those ones initially were being taxed at 14%, but right now they have been reduced to, they have been changed to exempt which is both a positive and a negative. I say it's a positive because they are now exempt, but they and a negative because that status of being exempt, just as we had said earlier there, is that you cannot claim any input VAT that you've been charged by your, by your customers. So what that <clears throat> means is that that cost of VAT is going to be a cost of your production. And you, so in a way, it still increases the cost of the product that you have because you're not going to be claiming back any VAT amount. Another item that has been brought into VAT is insurance agency, insurance brokerage, security exchange mm -hmm. services. So all those initially were exempt. So whenever you're now going to get an insurance policy, and rather you're also going to be buying, uh, what do you call it, shares in the stock exchange, you should expect to see a line there called VAT for those services that have been issued. So that's another way of broadening the tax bracket. And then uh, the other item is medicaments. So these are medical items. They have also been changed from 0% to exempt status. So what that means is that they are going to, they are going to be claiming, they're not going to be claiming the VAT, but rather they are going to be taking it as a cost of production in their particular business. 
So those were the key highlights around the the VAT Act, and we can we can ink. Sorry, Shemba. Yes, before we go to the next act, which I see mm -hmm. we are coming into the income tax, yes. I want to know, I want to remind all our, all our participants, in case you have mm -hmm. any questions or clarifications you'd like on what just what has just talked about VAT, the VAT mm -hmm. tax, feel free to write your questions uh, mm -hmm. or even raise your hands so that we don't leave you behind. But so far, just that, there are no questions. And okay. in case there are any questions, I'll, I'll let you know. OK, so if I move, I can move to the next one, which is the Income Tax Act. So Income Tax Act, remember what happens in the Income Tax Act? This one defines the, in, it's a totally different re re legislation from what we have as VAT. And this one is mostly around our business profits how we account for it as an income for the profit that our business makes. So that all that is governed by the Income Tax Act. And what we have, what, what changed around that one is that there was something we call the definition of qualifying interest. So qualifying interest is interest that is paid, initially interest that was being paid to an interest holder or rather to an investor was being considered only interest that comes from financial institutions. So there we are talking about interest that you have been paid by a, by maybe your bank for putting in, uh, what do you call it? You have put in a fixed deposit amount. So that's the only one that used to be called qualifying interest because of the financial institutions. But what we've seen has changed is that the definition has broadened to even include non-financial institutions. And what this means is that and, and financial institutions is a person whom you could lend them um, who could be paying interest, but they are not in the business of banking. So where I see this one coming in as an advantage is major, majorly because of us business owners. We sometimes pump in so much money into our business in the form of capital, but getting it out of our business is a challenge. How we or rather how getting the money out is becomes a challenge. So we have to be, what this means is that in case I pump in my money into the business and I call it a shareholder loan, uh, the business is allowed to pay me back that interest for the loan that I have given them. Now, that interest, it will become an allowable expense for the business, meaning that it will be deducted for tax purposes. Then for the interest that they shall pay me as the shareholder, they shall deduct withholding tax, which is final. And what that means is that I shall not be required now as the tax as the investor to account for that tax for that income separately when it comes to my end of year accounts. So that's a positive move by broadening the scope to include even our financial institutions. So as shareholder loans stand to benefit. I think what we can do there as business owners is check into how can we change our loan structures with our businesses so that as we earn the interest from our businesses we can take advantage of that loophole. The other one which was a bit unfortunate is the electricity expense, because remember some time back we are the government, it was hardly one year old, but it was a benefit that had been given to manufacturers, whereby they were allowed, as far as, they're, as long as they're in the manufacturing space, remember electricity remains to be one of the highest cost of production. Yeah? So what used to happen is that they had been allowed over and above your expense, electricity expense, you can claim up to an additional 30% as an uh, as an additional benefit. So that has since been scrapped off. So it's a bit contradictory to when we look at, we, are, we want to go through the big four agenda of manufacturing being a killer, a, a, a rather a key pillar. But now with the a, a, a re, return of, rather the deletion of that additional 30% expense, it becomes a challenge, but we wait to see what will come out of it. The other items that changed there were overhaul of capital allowances. So for capital allowances, remember what we mean is, for capital allowance, we mean, in case you have items that are in your business, in case you have items that are in your business, which are going to be very specific for manufacturing, the taxman gives you an additional benefit, which we call capital allowance. 
And what this capital allowance means is that you are allowed to write off the value of that, of that machine or that capital expenditure over a given duration of time. So uh, one incentive that used to be there was to have it as high as up to 150% of the value of up to 150% of the value of the machines or buildings. But, and it was also strategically placed that if you invest in a, in a place outside Nairobi, they had got three cities that were exempt, Nairobi, Kisumu, and I think Mombasa. So as a way of ex encouraging expansion of businesses or other industries out of the out of the capital cities, you could claim back up to 150%. But this one has since been reduced. I don't know whether they see that people are still not taking advantage of setting up industries in those prescribed regions. But what we are seeing is that it will be reduced from up to a maximum of 100% down from 150%. Then the claims that you used to make, uh, the, remember these are items that we call the, in, when you're preparing your tax returns, there's a portion which we call the wear, tear, wear and tear allowance, the investment deductions, all those items, how they are computed. Now it has changed such that you are now going to be computing them on a reducing balance basis. So that's, that's, that's a bit, it's, it's a bit of a stifle because it means that there is less to be claimed over time. And therefore businesses which were enjoying longevity by having tax losses to carry forward over time, will have very minimal of them to carry forward, giving them a position that their tax losses will no longer be a shield as, as they would have been initially. Then decelerated claims. So that's what we are saying along with that is the rates have changed. So initially we used to have items that, such as hotel buildings, uh, hotel buildings, yeah. manufacturing buildings, hospitals, petroleum and gas facilities, all those, we, the rate has now changed to 50% in the first year and the residual at 25% on a reducing balance going forward. So these ones are things that maybe you need to check uh, from your particular business and in consultation with the respective tax consultants or accountants that could be assisting you. Make sure that we get the correct category because there's going to be a very, it's going to be a tough computation of knowing how to compute this going forward and, and uh, from, especially from the residual balances. Also education buildings, including the student hostels. So all those have been reduced down to 10%. So it's no longer attractive from a tax perspective as it was, but I think it's a countermeasure of saying that since we are going to be reducing, we have given the benefit of POIE and corporate tax, therefore then these ones have come to bear the blunt of, of the reduction. So those ones, con okay. when we, when we, Sheba, can you? Yes, um, the, I see there's a question on qualifying interest and, mm -hmm. and uh, point you could clarify where mm -hmm. Muraria is asking uh, mm -hmm. when the business pays you back, the money mm -hmm. pays you, he, he got confused on how, uh, on the explanation of the qualifying interest. Oh, okay. So about qualifying interest, remember qualifying interest earlier was only for interest that you are paid by, by a commercial bank, by a financial institution, which used to be called, that's what we used to call qualifying interest because it was only up to, they will pay you, then they will withhold some amount and up to, I think it's up to 15%, they will withhold. And then thereafter you'll be left, you call it to be your final tax. Now, what has happened is that the scope has changed, the, or rather the definition has broadened to mean that not only interest you earn from, your, from the bank, maybe from the fixed deposits or savings account, but also interest that you earn from non-financial institutions. And non-financial institutions mean like even our businesses. So in case you've invested money in a business and by giving them a loan, then that interest that they are paying you is considered to be qualifying interest. So that's the, that's the whole difference around it. Okay. So around- Miradia, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, Miradia says uh, it's very clear. Okay. Uh, Simon asks, what does farm works cover? Farm works, farm work, those ones we call them farm work deductions. Maybe you have the machinery that you're using in your farm, maybe the tractors, the, the, the hauliers, the diggers, all those items that maybe the farm store. 
for this one mostly affects people who are in business and uh, they are in agribusiness and we've got all these agricultural structures so those ones are considered separately so uh, machinery that is used mostly for farm farming activities that's what it covers okay um so. i don't know how you would like us to there are some two questions on vat how mm -hmm. would you like us to handle that do you go ahead and then we come back to that Mm, I would suggest because we are not so far off, we can mm. we can complete because income tax is one which was a bit bulky. Okay. I can complete income tax and then we can look into both of them at the same time. We are still on schedule for right, have capacity good. for that. Yeah. All right. So, so when you talk about the capital allowances which have been overhauled, it's not only for it's even the machines that businesses have, and uh, there we are talking about. Remember here, what we are looking at are what used to be given as investment deductions in the form of wear and tear allowance. So the different categories that we used to have, and what happens is that we have in, in tax purpose, for tax purposes, we've got two items. We've got what we call an accounting profit, and then we've got what we call the taxman profit. So what the accountant profit has, it has what we call depreciation as an expense. But when it comes to tax purposes, we remove that depreciation and we add back what we call we are capital allowances. So all these are the ones that now the taxman has changed the rate that he or she, or rather he used to give as the tax rate. And it will be, be a big difference between what the taxman has and also what the accountant has. So for those businesses which have got an asset, we call a deferred tax asset. This is one area that we need to be watchful about because how we are going to be computing it is going to be a bit different now, or not differently per se, but it's something that we we'll need to be extra cautious, especially because of that, that overhaul on, on the capital allowances. That's what we have for that. The other item that came in as a change is what we call turnover tax, which is pretty interesting, and I'd like to dwell on it for some time here. And what we see, remember, TOT is what we call a turnover tax. Is it Earlier on, it had been eliminated, and it had been replaced by what we used to call a presumptive tax. And what used to happen with the presumptive tax is that it, the presumptive tax was meant to be you pay a certain percent when you're collecting your business license uh, from the county government. So what the taxman was trying to achieve in this point was to broaden and get the informal sector into paying taxes. But I don't know whether it's because there was a disagreement between the KRA and the county government as to who is going to collect that money. It became a bit of a administrative issue. So presumptive tax has since been reduced uh, eliminated and now it's now being brought up in the form of turnover tax. And now what turnover tax has done is that the rate has been reduced down from 3% down to 1%. Remember this one is on your, on your gross business receipts. Whatever money you make top line, you get 3, 1% and then you pay it on a monthly, on the following month. The other change that has come there is that the threshold has increased from 5 million up to 50 million. So it was to be a lower amount earlier, but now as a way of broadening the scope, the threshold has now been put into 50 million. So we expect that many businesses are going to fall into this category by virtue of 50 million, which is quite high per annum. And also the minimum threshold has now moved from 500,000 to 1 million. So it's, it's still not clear what happens if your business falls below 1 million, because if you are below 1 million, it means you're not paying, you have neither paying turnover tax and neither are you paying income tax. So that's one of the changes that we need to, we expect to be clarified as we proceed. Eh? Then in, another thing that has come in there is that turnover tax had been incorporated companies yeah so any business that is incorporated as a company maybe dash dash limited initially it had been eliminated from turnover tax but right now with this amendment we are seeing that it has been scoped in so it's it's going to be a positive depends on how we look at it and the date of payment still remains to be the 20th day of the following month so when others are paying VAT, you also pay your turnover tax for the previous month so uh, what we need to note is that TOT, uh, turnover tax, is final tax. 
So you'll not be paying installment taxes, but rather you'll be filing, you still continue to, and then there will also not be any that annual tax returns that you'll be doing at the 30th of the uh, 30th of June, if you're a December year end. So TOT covers you from that perspective. There's a what question from mm -hmm. Patrick asking, mm -hmm. if I'm registered for VAT, does mm -hmm. it mean I pay turnover tax? If you're registered, yeah, in fact, that's the point where I wanted to arrive at to discuss on. Remember, turnover tax is under the income tax regulation, is, a, is part of income tax and it manages the payment of profits. Whereas VAT on the other side is around sales that you have made. So those are two different jurisdictions. And what happens is that in case you are, the registration for VAT is in case your sales turnover are up to 5 million in a given year, then you are definitely going to pay VAT. However, for turnover tax, that's a totally different jurisdiction. So yes, you can be registered for VAT and still be registered for turnover tax. The only thing that will not happen is that you not be registered for VAT and at the same time be registered for this income tax act, for the income tax. So it's turnover tax and VAT are two different jurisdictions and they are going to be paid separately. So the criteria for VAT is 5 million threshold, which we see is, is within the turnover tax threshold because turnover tax captures turnover, uh, the TOT covers 5 million all the way up to 50 million. So in case your sales are maybe 10 million, yes, you're registered for VAT. However, you can choose, will I go through the turnover tax when it comes to paying my income tax returns or will I go through the Kawaida income tax that we've been having? So that's the difference. And the only way that if you are going to be, if you're operating between 5 million and 50 million, then definitely you fall under TOT. The only time you not fall under TOT is if you are in the business of rental income, rental income is not uh, included in, it's not eligible for turnover tax. And also professional and management services are not included for turnover tax. So things that we do, things like professional audit, trainings and all those, as we are not going to, it doesn't matter whether we are in that threshold, the mere fact that we are in professional services, we are not eligible for turnover tax. And the reason is simple because we are saying withholding for professional services, they are already bearing a blunt of 5% withholding tax. Yet, turnover tax is 1% of your gross revenue. Therefore, it's going to put, if, you are going, if I'm going to pay 1% of my gross revenue, yet my, I'm being withheld a 5% by the service, by the people who might provide the service, it means that that company or rather that business will always be in a credit position, which is not feasible. So that's why it's clearly eliminated the professional services and also management and rental income. Another thing that they could have contributed to the elimination is because of their margins. Their margins are deemed to be quite big. Therefore, they can absorb. They are not better off in turnover tax because the taxman stands to lose from that perspective. Okay. So the rates of income tax, those ones we had already gone through, we are saying the personal income tax has reduced from 30% down to 25%, which is a positive. And then we, are see, we saw a 100% tax relief for persons earning less than 24,000 every month. And the, the other item was an increase in personal relief down from, or rather, Initially, we had the annual relief was 16,896 every year, which translates to 1,408 per month. But now this has been increased to 28,800 every year, so down, which is translates to 2,400 every month. So what that means is just as we have said, as a business, as an employee, in case the, the income is, the gross income is 24,000, that person does not pay any tax, or rather does not have any PE liability. But it, in case it goes anything above that, they will st they'll have to pay for, for the difference. Then withholding tax was also another interesting one because withholding tax, remember, is, it means it's when the person is paying you, they pay you less a certain amount of tax and instead they give you a certificate. So what that means is that they have paid your tax, they have paid taxes on your behalf. 
So the change that came there is that in case you have got investors in your business, and some of these investors are considered to be non-resident. Remember, a non-resident person is a person who has no permanent establishment in Kenya, and you pay them dividend. The withholding tax rate has been increased from 10% all the way to 15%. So that's another, it's a bit of a, back, it's a hit to the investor businesses which have got foreign, foreign shareholding. So that's going to be a bit of a delay on their side. Then there are some additional items that have been scoped in into the withholding tax angle. And what we are talking about is, and I know many of us are in that pro space, if you are in the business of sales promotion, marketing, advertising, and also transportation to some extent, remember now when your suppliers, when your clients are paying you, they are going to pay you less withholding tax. So what that means is that they are going to pay you the 95, is it 85%, and then they are going to pay you an amount, they are going to give you a withholding tax return in exchange. So, okay, it's not much of a big deal because it had already been there. Majority of the businesses had been classifying these items as professional services, which were already attracting a, a withholding tax in the first place of 5%. So it's just that it's been broadened to now say marketing, sales promotions, those ones have been included as part of it. The, the, the exception there is it's also included transportation, but it has categorically said that in case of transportation and you're paying to East African EAC citizens, businesses that are of those, uh, those three member or rather those member countries, you are not going to apply withholding tax because I think that's a, a, I'll call it to be more of an ESC agreement kind of setting to be, to have been respected in that angle. Then as we have seen the income, the tax rates have increased for, have changed for individuals. Also companies have enjoyed because the resident corporate income tax rate has reduced from 30% to 25%. Then what that means is that it's left companies which are non-resident, they will still be paying tax at 37.5%. So this is another option. Maybe a company can check, do we go through the local registration to become a locally registered company? There is a the question. Mm -hmm. uh, on the withholding tax aspect is Grace Maina is asking, is mm -hmm. it a must I register as a withholding agent? Uh, okay, about withholding tax, remember, withholding tax is not a question of registration. It's a question of the, as a business owner, you are paying, assuming maybe Grace provided a service to Centonomy, when Centonomy is making a payment for professional services, any amount, if the invoice amount is greater than 24,000, they are automatically supposed to withhold a 5%. So anybody becomes, a, uh, whenever you're making a payment to a, to a service provider and the invoice amount exceeds 24,000, automatically that one attracts 5%. So it's not a question of registration, you, it's, it's by default. So the other point that we shall be talking about is taxation of emoluments so, and pensions. So this one, uh, what has happened is that they have been harmonized. So in case you've got pay as you earn tax, and what we are saying is on the first 24,000, which are translates to 28,000 every year, the bracket has, is at 10%. Then on the next 16,667. So what we'll be seeing here is that the amounts here on the are on a monthly basis, then the bracket amounts represents the annual amount. So it's increased from 10%, or rather it's, it's, uh, it's cascaded from 10, 15, 20, all the way to 25%. So what you're seeing is that any amount that is in excess of 57,334 is going to be taxed at 25%. Then over and above that, you're going to get a, a monthly personal relief of 2,400. Uh, so what that means is that any, uh, the brackets have also been changed, which is another positive item. And it's, another, it's what we can be looking into as our way of what can we capitalize it, but we shall discuss it in under the way forward part of the session. Pension, remember for them who have got pension contributions, 
whenever they are receiving their pension contributions, I know there is a computation that goes around it and there is an amount that is tax free. And what has changed is that the pension tax band have been category have been harmonized to the payee tax bands. So that's to say anything that is over and above the tax free amount because the tax free amount is driven by the duration that you've been in that pension and the age of the pensioner. On the first 400,000, that person will pay a tax of 10%. On the next 400,000, they'll pay 15%. And on the third bracket of 400,000, they'll pay 20%. And on anything above 1.2 million, they will pay 25%. So what has happened here is that the pension items have been, they have been categorized or rather harmonized to in a way that they are in tandem with what the, the PAYE on the other hand has tried to, to achieve. So that's the change that has come in. And I think from that point, it, it appears that there, are, there have been both positive and negative uh, sides to the tax change. But what I would like to maybe emphasize it before I take questions is what we call our way forward there. Yeah? Because I understand that many of us are in business and maybe since the time and some of us Sheba started by saying some businesses have been affected positively where others, others have been affected negatively. The, what do we need to take from this webinar? What do we need to take for, so at, going forward? The first item is VAT reconfiguration. Remember, if you are already registered for VAT, the, the turnover remains as 5 million. But, and therefore you've got an ETR machine. It's necessary that you reconfigure your ETR from the 16% down to 14%. Then also check your products and services. Are they being categorized uh, correctly? Because we've got different changes that have come in. Some items have removed, have moved from exempt to zero rated and, uh, and vice versa. So you need to relook into your product, into your offering, see that you check the, and see that you have your products being taxed at the correct rate for standard rate, which is 14%, exempt and zero rated, which are zero. Treatment of VAT remains the same. In case you are standard, you can claim your VAT in case, and also if you are zero rated, but if you are exempt, you're not allowed to claim that VAT unless you sell a combination of standard rated and exempt items whereby you are allowed to add portion. Then the other item that we need to look at is monitor the various thresholds on a continuous basis. A lot is happening. And I, one thing that I would like to emphasize to entrepreneurs and business owners, if there has ever been a time that we need to be cautious about our tax positions, it's now. Remember, you see on all those rates that have reduced from 30% to 25% and so forth, eh? somebody has to find that, that gap has to be filled in one way or another. And I, I hope there's nobody from KRA hearing me, but KRA is not going to take it sitting down that our tax collection is going to reduce. So if anything, I've also, I've already experienced it with some clients whereby they are already being called to ask why a delay in payment for one month, maybe your POI or your VAT. So something that some are confessing they've never heard of it, even for a small amount. So I think our tax is going to be on the lookout, especially when we have people who are, we are, we are dealing with people who withhold VAT, who withhold taxes. There, it's going to be the system can easily monitor. Another nightmare that we've get we've been getting as business owners is what we call the VAA automated VAT audits. So all those VAT inconsistencies, I think it's something that we also need to look into and also file our tax returns on a regular basis. So let's just be cautious because this gap is quite big and anything can be rather monitoring from the KRA perspective is likely to be on a higher alert other than before. Then for tax planning opportunities, I can see some. I think just as we had said about uh, shareholder loans. So for us who have pumped money into businesses as our capital and we've never known how we are going to get it out of our businesses, we can consider, can we convert that capital into shareholder loans and interest that will come from there 
the business will enjoy the benefit of having it as an allowable expense. And then the outcome, the interest that we shall be paid, that you shall be paid as the business owner is, is going to fall under that category of qualifying interest. And therefore, the tax that you shall pay from that point is final. So it's a subtle way of business owners in uh, withdrawing money from their business that they have already bumped in. So I take that to be a positive. Then another item that we can consider is do I register for TOT instead of income tax? So what you need to check there is that in case it depends on what your margins are. But remember, we had said that if I've got, if I'm dealing with rental income and I'm also, or rather I'm dealing with uh, professional management fees, there definitely I'm not eligible for TOT. But if I'm in the wider business of buying and selling, then I can consider TOT. And where TOT comes in is it, it is all going to be driven by your, what we call it, by your margins. So let's, let's look at an example. Assuming you're a business and you've got a revenue of 10 million and your net profit is 1 million. So in, in such a business, if they go through the TOT route, their TOT will be 1% of the 1 million. So meaning that that business will pay a close to, it should be 10,000, 1% of the 10 of the 1 million, sorry. Yeah, they pay a tax of 10 of 10,000. Then on the other hand, if they were going to go through the income tax route, what that will mean is that they will pay 25% of the 1 million. So in that case, they will pay a tax of 250,000. So that's another opportunity that a business needs to look into. TOT is best suited for businesses which have got considerable margins because they can easily afford to pay that 1% as a margin, as, as, a, as a tax, and they are left with a bigger part as their profit share. Then the third opportunity, this is another item which we discuss at length, and we also even from our Centronomy Entrepreneurship classes, how do you pay yourself as a business owner? And I think now it's an opportunity in case you're in business, if you can have yourself a salary, then it, it will be a positive because how we are saying that with 14, with a 25% top rate of, of tax, then it means you'll be taking home more as opposed to even waiting for the business to reap a dividend and then get you into to paying you the dividends. So this is an opportunity uh, that you as a business owner can enjoy. And remember that your salary as a business owner becomes allowable for business purposes. So you'll enjoy the from a business perspective and also enjoy it as a business owner. And those were the key highlights. I know the act was very big. It had got other items to do with excess duty and all those. But for this particular session, we decided let's first of all focus on what affects SMEs. And these are the ones that we talked about, the VAT, the income tax, and it's quite a broad one. But I know, Sheba, you have questions on your side. And so that we also respect the time that is that we had scheduled for this, we are going to put some time for it and also to, to take any questions. I don't want to, or rather, I know the questions could be burning, but in case you have additional questions, which we shall not be able to address during the extra time that Sheba shall give us, we can have shared with you my email address there and also my contacts in case you need any further clarity or on any items that we've discussed or any that we feel could have been omitted. Great. Sheba, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Josephat, for, for this session. I know is uh, it has been just uh, slightly less than an hour, but we've been able to cover key aspects and questions are coming in really, really fast. Wow. Um, okay. And so the, let me start from they were based on the way they are coming in, right? Mm -hmm. okay. There's a question on, please clarify mm -hmm. by Rachel, please clarify professional services providers are mm -hmm. eligible to pay 5% withholding tax. Mm -hmm. Is this the final tax for the company or are there other additional tax charges? Uh, that 5% is a withholding tax and it's not final. So when they come to do their annual returns, they shall compute their tax amount and then offset it against what they have paid as withholding tax by virtue of being given those certificates. 
So what she needs to understand is that whenever she's, uh, uh, she supplies a service, a professional service, she is entitled to that difference of 5% in form of a, a withholding tax certificate. That is the one that she now she now, shall now use to pay her, to reduce her tax liability. So therefore, it's not final. It's subject to your. It's subject to further taxation. Thank you so much okay. for that. Mm -hmm. There's a question from Edda. You mm -hmm. have concluded by saying, as a business owner, pay yourself a salary, mm -hmm. and she's asking: once you put a salary for yourself, do mm -hmm. you include all the other deductions in the salary? For example, pay NHIF, NSSF. Oh, yes. Yeah. Remember, as a business owner, irrespective of whether you are, uh, the only time it changes is if you are, um, what do you call it, if you are a sole proprietorship, because there's technically, there's no difference between you and your business. But let's look at it from a registered company. You know, as a company, you've got, you could be a director and you could also be a shareholder of that company. Yeah. So what happens is that as a director, you are entitled to a salary because uh, in the long run, in the larger scheme of things, you are an employee of that business. So what happens is that, what happens is that you have got to, by virtue of being an employee, the PAYE, the NHIF, the NSSF that you give your other employees, you too are allowed to have it, and they shall be allowable business expenses for for your company. So that's an opportunity. So that's an opportunity for you yes, as, yes. as a business owner, yes. uh, and it's very helpful. So Patrick is asking, mm -hmm. I am a sole proprietor. So how many tax bands do I fall in? Mm, so for it should be only one. As a, If you are a sole proprietorship, it means that that's what we call personal income. So it's, it's you as the individual. So it's only for that. Remember, we only have tax bands for... It, you are either going to be a corporate or you're going to be an individual. So in your case, you're going to be falling under the category of the individual category. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Perpetual, I'll come to your question after we finalize with the tax matters. Um, Grace Miner is asking, and she had asked earlier that she need to register as a withholding agent. Now she's asking, how do I declare the withheld tax from my payments if I am not a withholding agent? Mm, remember, okay, if I get Grace's question, she's not an agent. Mm -hmm. Because remember what happens, the only agents that we have are VAT agents. When it comes to withholding tax, anybody who is making a payment, even you when you're making a payment to another business person, as far as the, the payment is above 24,000, you are supposed to withhold that 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 uh, that extra that five percent. So what will happen is that when you withhold, she will be given the person who was assuming. Let's assume she has she has provided a service to Centronomy. When she's making the service to when she's making the invoice to Centronomy, if the invoice is of above twenty four thousand, any amount that will be that amount attracts a 5% withholding tax. So Centronomy will pay her 95%, then the extra 5% will be paid in, will be paid directly to KRA. And when it's paid, it will automatically be uploaded in her iTax ledger. So when she goes to filing her tax returns at the end of the year, she will be appearing to have paid some tax in advance. So she will then offset that against the tax liability that she has for that particular year. Mm. And, and if I'm not wrong, as soon as uh, an agent has withheld the tax, you, you receive uh, an email, a communication from yeah, them. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get uh, you get a certificate and you get an email communication. It's a very it's been tried to be, and and this is where I think many entrepreneurs get it wrong. Yeah, whereby we say somebody withheld your tax at the rate of five percent, then when this same person is going to file their tax returns they go ahead and show that they didn't make any income. You see, that becomes self-contradictory because if on one hand somebody withheld your tax for providing a service, all that KRA needs to do is gross up all those 5% and they will see what was your total income for the year. So if you come to, if you then come and give a different story of saying that I had zero income that year, you are just shooting yourself in the foot because it's already there in your ledger that somebody withheld your tax and somebody remember another thing is that 
there is withholding tax and there is withholding VAT. So all those are, you can be subjected to both depending on the nature of your service. So it's very necessary that you look into them and make sure that they are in tandem with what you come to disclose as your annual returns at the end of the year. Right. Thank you so much. Grace, please let us know if you've been answered. And in case you know you still have some questions around it and that are very specific to your business, please contact, send an email to Josphat or write him an SMS or a call and he can give you more clarity. Vincent asked, does it mean if you're paying MRI tax, you won't pay TOT? I believe you said it, it is exempt. Uh, MRI, what, what did, monthly, I that... monthly rental income tax, you do not yeah, pay yeah. TOT. Yeah, rental income is exempt from TOT. It's not in that Great. category. TOT is not for professional services and neither is it for, for rental income. Right. Perpetual asked a tax question. So does this mean that if you now on the matters of income tax, does this mean that if you are registered for income tax and your annual turnover is between 1M and 50M, you mm -hmm. can deregister for income tax and mm -hmm. register for TOT? And yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question because we are yet to get the remember the remember this thing is still work in progress and we are yet to get to know how KRA is going to handle it because they are yeah as she's correctly put it there are businesses which are in the category of one million to fifty million so as to whether they'll be doing turnover tax this year and then annual tax the other year it's not quite clear but what I know is that whenever you're registering a business income tax by default comes in it's a default setting the only one that you change there is if you ever look at your tax obligation in your withholding or rather in your tax certificate is the vat but all with income tax that one definitely you are there so as to whether tot will be added as an obligation we are yet to see how that is going to roll out because they've made it quite attractive because if I'm going to, if my business is between 1 million and 50 million and my margins allow me, I'd rather pay 1% of my gross revenue and I'm done to Malizana and KRA for that year. I'll not pay any tax. But as to whether you can, if you're already in registration for income tax, whether you can jump back to TOT, that one, I think we'll need to look at it. Uh, we, we, are, we are also waiting to hear, maybe in case there's a tax another tax expert in the room, maybe they can shed some light, but that one we can get back to her with updates on how it happens, because it's still new. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. She's also asking if mm -hmm. one had already sold some standard products after mm -hmm. 1st of April, and she mm -hmm. sold them at 16% mm -hmm. instead of 14%, mm -hmm. how can this be corrected? Oh yeah, that's an interesting one. Remember, what happens is that by if you've already filled your returns, you'll notice that the ITAX, the the what do you call it, the tax return right now is not it's not it's been already reconfigured and it's not taking sixteen percent. So it, you definitely have to. I would advise to issue a credit note for that extra two percent. And when you file your returns, you file because the system by itself will not accept a rate of. 16 percent for an invoice after first of april so consider having a credit note and then do the returns accordingly for at 14 percent which is what the system is going to accept great thank you for that mm -hmm. um then there were some questions on vat the mm -hmm. vat where mm -hmm. does um, m jogu ask him where mm -hmm. does imported baby clothes fall under the vat categories wow that one is very specific. I need to look into that one. Imported baby products. Imported mm. baby? baby? Baby clothes. clothes. Mm. I'll look at them as... Can we pack that one? I get the specific. Yes. But my guess is that clothes, just like any other, will be under the standard rate. Okay. Yeah, if anything, even right. babies are more expensive. Oh, Josphat, is there a place where a, a business owner can go and read where this uh, VAT, where their business falls under VAT categories? Uh, okay, so now uh, under the three categories, yeah? Yeah, where their Indeed. business falls. Is there a place someone can go read or access? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I hope it will not be a tough one, but it's under the VAT Act. It has got a okay. whole schedule of different products, and it mm. is going to tell you which products have got which rate. Mm. 
at okay. any one given time yeah fantastic so yeah. you hear that if you have some time go check out the vat act but mm -hmm. also mjogo i recommend you drop an email to josphat that way he can even check and revert to you um yeah. martin ocheng asked is it possible to offer etr mm -hmm. receipts without registering for vat <laughs> <laughs> That's like, that's, that's like giving sacrament and you're not a father. <laughs> so, anyway, on a light note. Yeah, you should be registered for VAT for you to offer, to, to give ETR receipts. So it's because technically then what happens when you collect the money? Because you remember VAT, you are charging people money, and then you collect it on behalf of the people on the on behalf of the government. So if the government does not know you that you collect for them, and the only way they can know that you collect for them is by being registered, then it means you are going to be taking money and not accounting for it, and it can be a bit it it will be punitive. I know right now there is that loophole. I have mean, seen it happen. Many companies are registering for they are buying ATR machines and yet they don't have the VAT obligation. Uh, some time back it KRA was so strict on that because what used to happen is for you to get an ATR machine you had to have the VAT as your obligation. Now what will become what can what can expose you there is you charge VAT to a customer then this customer goes ahead and claims that VAT and yet you don't appear to have filed for that VAT in the first place you will be shooting yourself in the foot because KRA will know that there's a, there a masquerade somewhere. And there, that's the whole point of this item we call the automated VAT audits. That's why we are finding inconsistencies because somebody claimed VAT and yet it was not disclosed on the other side. So I think the prudent thing is let's work about how you can register it and also account for the amounts that you've collected and then i'm not acting as an kra agent let me not be mistaken for that but just to caution yourself don't uh, lest that automated vat exercise catches up with mm. you yeah fantastic and also martin ocheng still asks again how mm -hmm. can a business that has converted from mm -hmm. sole proprietor to mm -hmm. to a private limited company do to file its tax Ah, okay. So what will happen, that one is not going to be an issue because the date of conversion from sole proprietorship to limited company is going to be the date of, that, that's the date you start your new obligation. Remember, as a sole proprietor, you had a different obligation from a company. So you will file your tax returns up to the end of sole proprietorship years. Remember, sole proprietorship year is a, a calendar year, January to December. So you file for those for that particular year of income then the date of registration of company now becomes your new date so assuming you operated in june up to you are in january to J december 2019 so january to june you operated as a sole proprietorship then first of july you converted into a limited company so when you're filing your tax returns you shall file two you shall file one as a sole proprietorship for the income that you earned between January and June. And then you file another one as a limited company for the income that you earned between July and December. So that's the distinction. Great, great. And Angela Ngebe asked mm -hmm. a, uh, an important question that I've, I've seen quite a number of clients having. She says, mm -hmm. I registered a company in November 2019, but mm -hmm. we have not been able to transact. Mm -hmm. Now, KRA have sent uh, an email or something to me as mm -hmm. a pay request for the mm -hmm. months November, December, Jan, and Feb mm -hmm. because she did not do nil returns. She's asking, how do I go about not paying this as, a, as really the company did not make any transactions at all? Ah, okay. That's, that's interesting, Angela. So what happens, Angela, is that the minute to register for an obligation, it's up to it's it's the prudent thing to do is if you don't do any business just go ahead and file an ill return because the minute that obligation is sitting there failure to remit an ill return automatically triggers a penalty because you registered for the obligation in the first place and KRA the way they've become a bit stubborn right now is when it comes to applying for waivers it might be a bit of a challenge it's not a guarantee now that the 10,000 waiver will be given. So what my guess here is that is that she 
registered for PAYE as an obligation, but could be that she didn't file nil returns. What I will advise is going forward, just the cost you uh, consider having nil returns being done by the ninth day of the following month to save you that extra 10,000. Then for these others, if you have those obligations, the 10,000 that have accumulated for, she said three months. Um, uh, yeah, it's about four months because yeah, she decided so, in November 2019. It's a couple of months actually. So I'm giving it tops, that's about 40 Gs, eh? 40K. So even though you'll be paying it pole pole, go ahead, but don't let it accumulate any further than it already mm. has. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'd like to recommend, uh, I'm seeing Patrick asking, can we contact Joe Fat for SME consultations? Yes, yes, yes. And that's why he's one of our trainers and we're also having these sessions because we know you have so many questions and queries. Feel free to take a screenshot of this. And for everybody who is asking, yes, we're going to share with you the recording because we have been sharing it on on facebook and also on the recording we are going to share it with you and i know josphat is also going to share with us the 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 presentation for you to be able to go and have a look at it um, it will be pdf and then he will share it to us and you will receive it in your emails um i think we have one more question so audrey i know you are driving and listening in at the same time so don't worry, you're going to have the recording for you. Just fat, everybody says thank you for the well explained presentations because we may not have enough time to talk about costs right now, how much he charges, please reach out to him. And if you are a centronomy entrepreneur, mention that. Uh, he may give you an exam, I don't know. <laughs> and then um, you'll be able to learn more. Uh, there's one more question. Mm -hmm. okay. that maybe we could tackle before we mm -hmm. finalize Surely. um weekly or monday asks mm -hmm. i'm employed by a hospital but i also have a registered health facility where i also see patients should i mm -hmm. register the facility with kra or should i just use my kra pin i think as a sole proprietor what other obligation does this facility add me now sounds like a whole uh, con <laughs> That's a very, yeah. that's a diagnostic thing, but it, rem yeah. it depends on how he has registered it, because if he has registered it as a business, as a sole proprietorship, then he has an obligation to, he, he, he to him, it's going to be his personal business income. And the mm -hmm. obligation that I can think about there is if it's a registered as a business, as a sole proprietorship, he is going to have that income tax as an obligation. Then over and above that, if he has employed employees who are earning more than the 24,000 that we've stipulated there, then that is going to definitely attract pay as you earn tax. So that's a whole registration by itself. But a being a hospital, I guess then there would be no need for medical, uh, for VAT. So because most of the medical professions are exempt from VAT. So top of mind, I can think only of those two, income tax and pay as, pay as you earn. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for all the engaging questions. Uh, I know that the thing with tax, um, you sometimes you leave with more questions than answers, but I always say that's a good thing because it means you can then go and ask the direct questions that you have. We seek and our goal, I know many of you graduated last week. Congratulations to all our Centronomy entrepreneurs in the house. And those who haven't joined us yet, we welcome you to Centronomy Entrepreneur. This is where we'll be having so many of these conversations every other week. Um, from June 2nd, we are starting the Centronomy Entrepreneur. Um, and also for all of you who are our alumni, we want you to know that we will continue working with you, holding your hands even as we go by. So make sure you're on the lookout for all the webinars we'll be having for you, all the events we'll be having for you to support as you continue on the journey to run your business. And in case you have any question, remember you can always reach out to us. Um, feel free on matters accounting and taxation to reach out just fat. He'll be with you as well for all those who are going to join us for the next um, intake. He'll be with you as well for accounting as well. And we welcome all of you. Karibuni sana, continue doing the most for your business. 
guys. And remember to share this gift of Centronomy Entrepreneur to also your fellow colleagues or friends, family, people in your networks that you know are interested or are keen on running, learning how to run a successful business. Tell them what you learned. Tell them all the things that you learned in design thinking, working capital, in accounting. Many of us are in a space where you're thinking, we are going through COVID, should I, COVID, should I raise capital, should I get a loan? So many questions around that, and that's what we do here at Centronomy Entrepreneur. So in case you have all these questions, I'd like you to, I'd like to inc invite you to Centronomy Entrepreneur, and also you invite your friends, if you're already an alumni, or are, if you're already the, in the alumni database or in our group, tell them to join. We are having amazing um, discounts for them, and we can't just wait to have them.